Hello, this is Douglas Rumbaugh. Uh, if you if you did not watch the last video in this series, the basic idea here is I am screwing around trying to learn GNOME development, and I'm just walking through the documentation and figuring out live. Well, not live, but live-ish. So you can watch me struggle with it if that's what you're interested in. And I am joined tonight, apparently, by my cat Sheba. Get down. Okay, so she's not going to go away. Um, at the end of the the last video, uh, we had set this thing up so that we have a counter that actually counts. Now, currently, it's the compiled version right now. Currently, still has that buffer overflow we intentionally built in. Uh, but we can fix that by just recompiling. So let's go ahead and do that. So remembering that we can use the this package config command to in automatically generate our necessary include path and libraries. Otherwise, we'd have a hell of a lot of typing to make this thing work. Okay. And yes, I believe that should. <coughs> we should now have a 100 character buffer for that. So, buffer overflows not really going to happen. But the problem, well, it's not really a problem, but the, the thing that I was worried about at the end of the last video was that the way this program is set up right now it, there's no not really a good way of getting rid of of this right so we're allocating an integer on this on the heap here using malloc giving it that initial value and that that's we pass a pointer of it around to it around and that's how we're keeping track of that incrementing number right and when we press the button it calls um calls this stuff so here's where we connect. When the button is pressed, button clicked, we call this function print hello up here. And then this i is a pointer to the data that, the, well, what we're calling the user data here. And remember, as we discovered last time, that this g pointer data type is basically just an alias for a void pointer. So you can throw any pointer you want into this thing. As a matter of fact, you don't actually need this cast, I don't believe, either. But, uh, get rid of that. All right. Now, immediately after stopping recording and upload, or what, when I was in the process of um, editing and uploading, I realized exactly how we could resolve this problem of not being able to free this. So, I'm not gonna actually move on I do want to experiment with fixing that problem here. So this should be fairly quick. Now the thought that I had, or perhaps less of a thought and more of a realization, is that hey, so what we're doing is we're allocating this thing on the on the heap and we're passing it in as this user data, this G pointer user data to our our button thing. But notice Our activate function that actually sets up our app, so to speak, is nothing more than one of these event handlers as well. This one is this one is handling the um, the activate signal. It's handling the start the app signal, and we can pass user data in for that too. So the reason why we can't free this easily is because we don't want to free it inside of the button. That would be stupid. The whole point is we want to we want to retain it between button presses. That's why we put it on the heap to begin with, and we can't free it in here because, as we discovered last time, while we were trying to figure out this user data pointer and getting all this stuff to work, uh, this function returns. Right, this, we're, we don't get stuck inside this function waiting for the button press and blah blah blah. This function runs all the way through, and then we get stuck in a um, in a main program loop somewhere where we wait for and handle the signals. 
So if we were to go ahead and just stick a, a free down here, so if we just go ahead and free I like that, what's going to probably end up happening is, yeah, so it's not working anymore. And the reason why it's not working anymore if we free it here is because this free gets called before I press the button. So this function runs all the way through and sets everything up, <clears throat> but the program isn't idling, so to speak, inside this function. It's idling somewhere else. So yeah, if I free it here, then when we actually press the button, this pointer to the user data that the button gets as input is pointing to a chunk of memory that I freed. And that's not a good thing. So we can't free that. However, if we look down here <clears throat> at the main function, we do have some cleanup. <coughs> ah, excuse me. Uh, we do have some cleanup code going on right here. So what if, what if we did this? I'm gonna take these two lines and I'm gonna go ahead and throw them, uh, let's just throw them here. Now, when I connect up my activate signal, I'm gonna change this null out for an I. So we're now passing this in as the user data for our activate function. And then we can come up here to our activate function. Yeah. I can use my text editor, capital G, there we go. Uh, we can go up here to the, this guy and replace I here with user data. So we are allocating this thing on the heap here inside of main and it gets passed around. And then we can free it. So this should work, I think. I think, famous last words. Hey, okay, so this is working now. Um, this is working and we no longer have a memory leak because our thing will get freed. Now admittedly one variable is not the end of the world, um, but you want to be careful about about that, you know, if you, uh, if you have, oh, you know, just one, one, one variable isn't the end of the world and then, oh, but it's just two variables and then suddenly you have an application with thousands of variables, none or thousands of objects on the heap, none of which are being freed and you run out of memory. So you want to try and police these things. Every malloc should have a free associated with it. There we go. So that should now be freed properly. So that's the trick. I'm thinking for any, and again, I haven't been reading ahead, uh, but I'm thinking that for any substantial app, what probably ends up happening is you end up creating a struct and then using that struct to contain all of the relevant like session data and then passing a pointer to that struct around everywhere as this user data variable and i bet you that's how you how you handle that in general uh, but we will find that out so that was pretty quick uh, one other thing i want to point out that i've discovered again immediately after finishing is there's this program called dev help which is a it's a it's a gnome utility and it actually contains within it all of the documentation that I was I was reading off of a web browser early earlier so if we go here to the reference manual basics this is this is the tutorial that I was following as sort of the starting point for what we see here. So I can actually look at this stuff without using a web browser, which is quite nice. I've always been a fan of offline documentation. Uh, the, the thing that bo bothers me with web browsers is 
you know, you have your programming documentation up in your web browser, but all of your your fun, time wasty websites are just a a new tab away. So <laughs> this keeps you off the web browser, which I think probably will help productivity. Uh, and there, you, you can get a lot of the GNOME specific documentation running in this thing just by installing the right packages. As, as I understand it from reading about it, it shouldn't be too difficult to get other documentation rendering in here as well. And that's something I am going to play around with because I, I do kind of just generally like the application. And it'd be nice if I could get more than just um, the GTK and the GNOME stuff in here. Uh, but anyway, that's a that's a problem for another day. So I'm going to call that here for this one. It was relatively quick. Uh, in the next one, we're going to start here. This is a pretty short, pretty short one, but I have a feeling we'll have a lot to play with um, on packing, setting up containers, and putting multiple UI elements into our windows. And then from there, we can look at um, setting up these user interfaces using XML rather than coding everything manually and then it walks through an example of making a making an app that we'll uh, we'll play along with so well, it looks like we have a struct we set up a struct for the application as well oh cool. anyway looking ahead reading ahead uh so yeah i hope that you found this interesting and i'll see you in the next one when we start playing around with this packing stuff <laughs>